Hello, um, we are delighted to have with us today to discuss catalyzing capitalism through public private partnerships. Uh, now, I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly, Teresa Ribeiro. Ribeiro, okay, from Portugal. Um, Vilia Lubi from Estonia. Hello, everyone. Alan Lau from Singapore and sometimes Indonesia. Um, Peter Lazu is not with us at this moment. And last but certainly not least, Nico Anten from the Netherlands. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, and there's me. I'm Peter McGill, and I'll be moderating this thing today. Now, um, we'll start by each of us making some introductory remarks, and then we'll go into the discussion. So let me kick it off with some remarks of my own. I'll try and make them as painless as possible. So um, I'm speaking from England, where we're still very firmly in the grip of the pandemic. And with more than a million deaths worldwide, everyone's wondering when this nightmare is going to end. We don't know the answer. And what we do know is that most of our economies have been severely damaged. And we know that if the economy is going to recover, increased investment in infrastructure must play a vital role. Why will greater investment in infrastructure be so vital? Well, firstly, because it generates new jobs through the multiplier, not just those directly employed in construction, but along the whole supply chain. Depending on where and how the investment is targeted, new infrastructure will also increase efficiency and productivity. Welcome. The current global crisis also gives us the opportunity to restructure, to commit ambitious climate change targets for low or zero carbon emissions. And here again, infrastructure has an essential role, especially in energy. And another advantage of targeted infrastructure investment is to propel other kinds of technological change, for instance, by rolling out the famous 5G. Finally, stepped-up investment in infrastructure can address the pressing need to replace aging and sometimes dangerous legacy assets, many of which now go back 50 or even 80 years. And I should say that one important question I hope we can touch on is why we now have such a huge infrastructure deficit. How on earth did the rich, developed economies ever allow this situation to happen? Prioritizing infrastructure projects carries its own challenges, but far more contentious is deciding how they should be funded. On the one hand, COVID-19 has placed enormous strain on government budgets. This argues in favor of private financing. And there is said to be no shortage of private capital available for infrastructure. On the other hand, rarely has it been cheaper for governments to borrow to directly finance infrastructure, particularly if they're highly rated sovereigns. Questions. For riskier projects, is the best solution perhaps the middle way in which government loans and guarantees provide the confidence needed to lever in private funding? And should that catalyst be uh, a state infrastructure lender, an infrastructure bank, as some people propose, and some people are against? What factors are blocking greater application of the public-private partnership model? What interest infrastructure sectors are most suited to PPP? And for which, if any, is PPP not appropriate? PPP has proved extremely successful in funding renewable energy, particularly wind farms. Can it also be made to work for the largest and riskiest projects such as high-speed rail or even nuclear energy? Finally, yes, finally, if we want to catch up with China in 5G without using Huawei, is public subsidy needed or can we leave it all to the private sector? 
So that's my spiel, and um, I'm now uh, very happy to invite the first of our speakers to, to, to make some introductory comments. Uh, Teresa Hibe, would you like to start? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one interesting thing, Peter, uh, I say hello to everyone, but I say goodbye because you said everything I wanted to say. So, uh, you know, it's a little bit. But in any case, first of all, thank you for having me today with you. Um, it's a very interesting topic and it's a very, um, quite a, a hot topic. Uh, we are now in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it, it, and the pandemic was very clear. Uh, on the role of the of the state, uh, and it clearly reinforced the role of the state. Um, we need a state that is much more robust, um, that is able to provide the right answers um, to this terrible pandemic. And I'm not just uh, referring to the sanitarian effects of the pandemic, but uh, the second phase of this pandemic, which will be, of course, the recovery. And then again, uh, and we must not forget that, at least in the case of Portugal, uh, but quite a number of countries will be in a very stressful situation regarding uh, the fiscal situation, regarding uh, the fiscal. Um, so uh, that's the reason why um, we need, of course, private investments. Uh, we need uh, public investments uh, precisely to, um, to jointly uh, make the robust um, investments we need for this uh, recovery. Uh, and we need very coherent policies. And this is very, very important. I think these are the the, the ingredients uh, we need. Uh, because if we have uh, private investors, if we have uh, uh, some availability, and uh, of course in Europe, uh, as we approve this large package, uh, we are in the European Union, uh, we are going to have the possibility to quite invest a lot, so public money, um, but of course, uh, we need to combine these two sources, uh, but for that we need very coherent uh, um, policies. And I really want to stress this point, uh, because without the coherence of policies, we will uh, we'll not um, be able uh, to reach the goals uh, we really want to, to, to reach and will not be able to achieve the results we need uh, to respond to the demands uh, of, uh, of our population. This is very interesting. This pandemic um, showed that we need much, um, we need to, to recover it, but this recovery is not just uh, to be in two or three years in the same point where we were before the pandemic. No, we need to build back better, definitely. Uh, I... We need, uh, we need uh, to be more digital and this, uh, you know, the pandemic, uh, of course, had, was an, an, uh, uh, a big, big booster of, uh, of the digital agenda everywhere. Uh, but we need also to be greener. Uh, it is important. Um, and not only for uh, environment or climate change reasons, because this is technology, this is smarter, this is uh, so this creates new opportunities um, that are, of course, very important. But if you want to succeed, we need really to put all these ingredients together: coherence of policies, uh, public uh, public finance. Uh, in private investment uh, and, of course, a climate finance that is uh, friendly for uh, uh, this to happen. I'm going so to have, to, are I'm going to, have to halt you there. 
I'm going to have to Sorry? hold you there with great reluctance just to allow our uh, – it, it's, what you've said is absolutely fascinating, but I'm going to have to allow the, l- allow the others because we only have a, a sort of limited amount of time. Um, so I, I will have to turn to the others. Uh, yes, and, please do. Please do. Okay. I, I, I conclude. Thank okay. you very much. Well, no, it, it was excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, Mr. Luby, but you, 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 you're you next. You, you go ahead. Thank you so much and greeting from the, uh, the second biggest town of Estonia, Tartu. I'm just, you know, from my hotel room, I was just speaking at the Estonian Business Angels Network event. And actually, this this is a very, very, uh, let's say, important element. I actually want to reflect what my Portuguese colleague just said, that this COVID-19 crisis actually provides us a good opportunity, what PPP actually can be. Um, my, my, my opinion is that traditional PPP, I mean, especially if we take the well-known infrastructure development, for example, then it's very simple financial calculation. How cheap is the capital? For, for example, the, the, uh, the borrowing levels are very low. So why do you use PPP when government can actually borrow money much cheaper than the private sector can? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, but looking in the future, for example, I can give you a good example of what we are right, right now discussing in Estonia. When, when all our countries were in shutdown, especially in spring, but also now, then the e-commerce boom happened in Estonia, like in most countries, I suppose. And now I think that Estonia is sparsely populated, that we should have a, a, a parcel robots infrastructure in every single village in Estonia. So this is like the PPP kind of project that is possible. We have, let's say, parcel robots developers in Estonia, but we should go a bit beyond. So the real PPP can be that what can we do? What can, how can we use even even uh, even more? Right now we are calculating what can be the last mile government services that can be added on on this infrastructure. That we don't have those let's say physical let's say state institutions anymore, but we use those robots. We build up IT infrastructure on those robots as well. They can be bus stops. At the same time, so that my point is that we should uh, use PPP more like promoting innovation. Innovation is always risky, mm-hmm. and usually private sector needs government support in in order to, to rom- promote innovation. And also, government's role is very important in order to change the mindset of, of population. Because if government sticks to old habits, it's very difficult for private companies to change that. So I would I would see the COVID. 19 as a new lease of life for PPP and more focuses on innovation. Thank you very much. Alan, um, you've, you've had quite uh, a track record, I believe, in uh, PPP and uh, the World Bank and all sorts of other things. Would you like to say yes. something? Yes. Um, my company, we are an energy infrastructure project, you know, this, you know the you know, developer. We balance our business with social impact projects, such as low-income housing and drinkable water. My view is that the present uh, practice of public-private partnership in terms of infrastructure project development stresses and emphasizes value for money as the main criteria for the green light decision. What I would like to see is more as to a community base. How can how can PPP projects benefit the community? Because in spite of the billions of dollars that have been invested in PPP projects, yet you have a widening income gap, you know, an increase of the poverty. So something is amiss. Something serious is is amiss. And this pandemic has actually. You know, glaringly showed that this, you know, the lack of inclusive prosperity and people are left behind, and 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 this state just simply can cannot carry on. So that basically is where my focus is: is to look at how PPP can benefit the community, and it, the benefits can be filtered down to the grassroots level, and and that and that can be be done. I will stop here, but I will give. 
solutions, you know, this later on, on how that can be implemented. I do have my own idea based on my uh, experience on the ground. Yeah. And, um, so let's discuss. Yes, that- well, what, 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 these introductions are taking up quite a lot of time. Um, um, Nico, you're, you're, you're next. Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me here. No um, yeah. For me also, uh, Corona has a big impact in what is happening in our uh, society. And if you look at the use of infrastructure uh, after the lockdown of the country, the use of physical infrastructure dropped to below 50%. Now, uh, last week, we were back at 95% of the use of our infrastructure and there were no traffic jams. So the interesting thing is if you look at PPP, in just one dimension, okay, we should we have to build things, we have to develop things, and how can we finance it? We miss quite a point. Because if we add more levels, like the uh, behavior of people, how, how can we influence them? It turns out that uh, in the case of the Netherlands, the available fiscal uh, infrastructure is more than enough to deal with all the uh, demand for uh, traffic without any... Uh, further investment needed. If you look in our cities, uh, the increase uh, in demand for uh, goods via e-commerce was high because a lot of people turned to e-commerce for their shopping. And there you see also that you need this public-private dialogue, this public-private partnerships, because you don't want to have a negative impact on local communities. You want them to benefit So I think if we look in public-private partnerships and we add more uh, dimensions, which makes it more challenging, but also I think more rewarding because then we can make sure that certain people can join uh, our society instead of that we left them uh, behind. So in the end, I think Corona is a blessing in disguise. Thank you. But it is difficult. Thank you. And uh, Peter, I love you. Last, last. Peter, can you hear us? Yes, I'm just trying to unmute. Yes. I'm here. I've had technical okay. difficulties and apologies for the uh, for the kitchen background. It's been a bit of a nightmare today for some reason. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you, a, um, I guess, um, um, from, from my perspective is, is a little bit different. Um, I'll give it from an entrepreneurial perspective uh, as a serial entrepreneur myself. Um, and that's around, around the topic that we're talking about. And for mine, it's, it's, it's for me, PPP can be a great tool to promote and endorse the need for entrepreneurs to be at the core by, by bringing ideas to marketplace for sustainable development. And, and so um, I look at it that if, if we can obtain technology and scientific grants and government-driven performance contracts and, and economic development support, then entrepreneurs and their startups can certainly flourish to make a difference. And, and I guess uh, an example is what everyone's talking about, COVID, which is the new norm we live in today. Um, and with technological advancement, sustainable, sustain, sustainable and resilient infrastructure, we can surely pave the way for an inclusive post-COVID um, economic recovery. But what it does mean is that obviously we need governments um, um, to ensure uh, investments to go to innovative infrastructures projects that can be sustainable, technology advanced and resist and resilient. So that, that's my really short, brief uh, um, intro. Um, so uh, we can continue the conversation. I know you're running out of time, so I'm keeping mine short and sweet. <laughs> Perhaps I could start with one question. And I, I, I know um, the Secretary of State has to run out, so perhaps she can, she can take this before she dashes out. Um, do you think um, governments are up to speed with the, the challenge and the need uh, to um, invest in, in infrastructure? if we're going to have a pathway out of this crisis. I, I, I have the feeling in, in my own country that we're not at all ready. Um, um, my own, um, our own Council of the Exchequer is always talking about um, short-term short gap, income support, job support, that kind of thing. And we're not talking about longer-term exit strategies from the pandemic. Did you, did you hear me? Teresa, to, did anyone hear me? You all heard me? Yes. Does anyone want to take that up? 
Would you like to take it up, Mr. Mr. Newby? Would you like to? The question is about the, the response of government. As I represent the government, maybe I can at least uh, comment a bit. Yes. Um, yes. No. Right now, it seems to me that yes, governments are willing to take this uh, challenge. The only question is, what is the focus of this challenge? Uh, governments want to invest. They understand that uh, uh, learning from the previous economic crisis, government investments are very necessary. But I think that all the governments are ready to invest. But what uh, fellow panelists also say, it's very important to invest in uh, future technologies, not the old ones. Otherwise, just a waste of money. So I think it's not about making the right choices, not about making choices, or doing decisions. Because I think that every government is right now budgeting, we just need our budget. We are investing quite heavily in our infrastructure and we try to do it as smart as possible. So yes, I think we are to the challenge. Are any of you experiencing a lot of background noise? Is it just me? Yes, yes, I can, I can hear it. Uh, I can hear the background noise. I'm not sure who it is. Maybe if, maybe if everyone, uh, a suggestion is that everyone mutes when they're not talking, that might help. Okay. Well, um, would any, would any, um, uh, Teresa Hibera, would you like to say anything um, on that question about whether you think governments are up to speed with the uh, this challenge of infrastructure investment? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Peter, because for a while. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't uh, hear you. That's the oh. reason why you know I was. Uh, I was silent. Um, no, the, que the question. The question was that given the the urgency um, surrounding um, yes. the the economic conditions and um, infrastructure projects, as you know, uh, that the, the, they take a long time to plan and to implement many of them. Whether you think governments are. Um, treating this uh, with the urgency needed, uh, wh whether you think um, plans are sufficiently advanced or are we being too slow? Uh, this, is, this is quite a big question, you know, yeah. and uh, I can only talk um, from uh, what is happening in Portugal. Mm. Uh, and we are quite aware that urgency is, uh, is the word. Uh, otherwise, we are simply contributing for the private sector to to uh, to die or to uh, to weaken so much that will be um, very very difficult to recover. So you know the the urgency now is first of all is to keep uh, the productive structure there, the economic fabric there, um, ready to produce, uh, ready. Uh, to uh, to be um, active, okay? So this is the first thing to do. The second one is create the right projects and the right tools for financing these projects. And in Portugal, we are precisely in this phase of the process. Um, how to fund it, yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. How to fund it? what is the best way, what are the best projects. And in our case, you know, we uh, very, very quickly, we, um, we, we have plan, uh, a strategic one, um, and uh, we already, based on this plan, um, we establish uh, quite a set of, of projects, uh, and we are now presenting it to the European Union in order to have uh, its approval um, and in order to finance it with the um, European Union means. But you know, this is a very, very special situation of uh, uh, the countries, the member states of the European Un Union who are very, very lucky uh, regarding the, the available uh, the available funds. Uh, so this is a very special situation. But at the same time, you know, I'm in charge, charge of development cooperation, which means that uh, I, I, I have to, to tackle uh, the difficulties that the developing countries are uh, facing um, and how, uh, how they will recover. 
how can we uh, how can we work with them uh, in order to build uh, resilient uh, uh, and sustainable projects uh, how can we how can we create the uh, uh, the right conditions the the right climate finance uh, that is friendly for investment uh, how can they um, you know um, adopt the right policies so and this is much more trickier and uh, at the same time they are in a, in a in a debt stress situation that is a very serious one as we all it know as if, it looks to me as if Alan Lau is itching to to join in at this juncture is that right sorry uh, Alan can can you hear me your your okay. mute your, your microphone is switched off, Alan. Yes, yes. right. I'm back on. I'm back on again. I, I looked like you wanted to say something. Oh yes, I think this is a very challenging time because, in terms of the fiscal policy, is a very crucial as to how the government, given the the you know increase in debt, how do you actually look at funding some of these vital infrastructure projects, and also to ensure that there is inclusive pro prosperity because we cannot go by the same old model where the whole emphasis is only on value for money you must look into how the value is for the community and for the people so then then this actually begets a new approach to even implementation of public private partnership so like i mentioned the pandemic has actually showed the glaring dichotomy in terms of implementation and in terms of its that effectiveness so, how, how, so these you're talking about a more ground up approach to a ground up, but also but also governed by sound fiscal policy because i think there must be the political will to at least allocate even a small stake of the revenue for the infrastructure projects for the for the community well, you know, a lot of a lot of the developing countries don't have any money. Um, <laughs> to put it, to put it very bluntly, so um, I was just thinking that if we if we go back uh, to the aftermath of the great uh, glo the global financial crisis, uh, you'll all remember that it was um, China which sort of rode to the rescue then by plugging the demand gap through massive infrastructure spending. And that sucked in imports from, from the rest of the world. And I'm wondering, uh, China is, of course, a very hot button topic at the moment. Um, what role do you, if any, do you expect China to play as we uh, emerge from the pandemic? Um, there's a great need, an enormous need for money investment from the developing world. And of course, China has been lending billions to the developing world and uh, for infrastructure projects built by Chinese companies and Chinese labor. Um, do you think China will fill that void again? Do you think China will increase lending for no, infrastructure in developing countries? I think China has its own problems currently right now. Even the model that they have done through the BRI, I don't think is really effective or is or does that even benefit in terms of the um in terms of of the host country uh, in 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 terms of investment yes but then they use chinese companies they use their own state owned companies and they even use uh, their own chinese labor right. for the menial job that, that does not it does not help to transfer skills it does not help to create the bottom up approach in terms of job creation for the locals so but whilst i say that the present model that is being practiced by the world bank where you place only emphasis on the value for money is not even serving that either because the world bank is actually depending on the private investors right now through the i through the ifc and the community projects the world bank mega they don't have the mechanism to actually underwrite that they can only underwrite sovereign or either all the ministerial risk, but not the community or the municipal risk. So henceforth, this is why it's not, even with, with the, in spite of the money actually that have 
poured in for PPP project is not actually filtering down. The, the, the communities are not getting the benefits. The local SMEs are not getting the benefits. So I think we have to have a whole rethink as to how to have a more people oriented and how to actually implement that with and to be effective. And I see that one that one way to do that is to have a framework of a national foundation or a or a village fund or a community fund whereby a small stake of the infrastructure projects can go into that. Then you have a sustainable long term revenue stream to be able to fund the community project. And this has proven to work in you know Canada, in British Columbia, not not in the PPP, but for the gaming, whereby an, a small allocation is being given to the First Nations, the tribes, okay. and that has actually worked very well because there are multiplier effects as well with the community. I think it's a very very interesting. Uh, um, Peter, do you want to quickly um, follow up on that? Because yeah, I, have, I, I, there, there I, are I, I want questions. to. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to jump in because one of the things that my foundation is doing out of the UK is, is actually working from the bottom up. And this is one of the things that we've looked at in the fact that how can we get the global, glo the global communities around the world to become stakeholders? So one of the things that we're doing to try and support this whole mechanism of getting everyone involved is what we call the one dollar donation, which means that if we can get one dollar donations from everybody in the world, no matter who you are, how rich you are, how poor you are, in the sense of you can afford one dollar, then that's a contribution to help make the make the build the communities and start building ventures that become resilient and sustainable. Um, because at the moment we're just relying on governments, we're just relying on the wealthy and the private sector to try and pump money in to make a problem. But we've got to look at this with a completely different lens. Okay, we're trying to fix an existing problem. Sometimes it's about going about it in a completely different way, um, and that, that's that's you know my 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 view on this stuff. We've got um, to look at it differently. In terms of the green agenda. Um, there's a lot of talk, uh, as you know, about using uh, the, this crisis as, as an opportunity to restructure our economies to be low or zero carbon. In practice and in terms of PPP opportunities, what does that mean? Are we talking about, what are we talking about mainly? Are we talking about wind farms? Are we talking about... Um, um, inv investments in car batteries? Are we talking about energy storage? Are we talking? Give us, give us some examples of of where infrastructure investment can and should be targeted to achieve these global and EU goals. How, how should it be done? One of you. I mean, if I think of, if I think of, I, 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 I think of the UK and, and there's been massive investment in wind farm because it's been attractive to the private sector to, to invest in it and it worked very well. Um, so uh, that's what about other countries? Well, maybe Peter to give a start, please. Uh, if this five you, um. You see that uh, after the initial response of governments to the to the crisis, they they try to keep the economy working. Mm. But we should not make the mistake that we take all the plans we were planning to uh, execute and just continue, but to rethink really about what is the need what we have and what we see in the logistics industry worldwide is that the uh, concept of the just-in-time in worldwide supply chains is not a very robust uh, approach. And you see the companies all coming to the conclusion, if I want to sustain, I have to become sustainable. And there you see a lot of collaboration. And the collaboration is not about only about wind farms or, or uh, hydrogen, but also can we collaborate in new ways. Even we see examples of competitors collaborating in a way to make their business more sustainable. And I think this would be a dialogue we need between the industry and the uh, government, so a public-private uh, dialogue, which is also about my foundation. But we also should include the community in this. So it should not be just technical discussions. 
uh, between the, uh, the professionals, but also how to add and involve the communities and the citizens. But I mean, part, of, part of what you're saying is that there should be reshoring, that um, you know these global yeah. supply chains are not yeah. sustainable, and that production has to come back onshore. But in addition to that, you're saying that it should directly benefit uh, community. Yeah, but because there you can you have also then the support of the community to uh, to the change uh, you need. So the biggest uh, what should be the weight of this crisis if you go back to the old normal, because I think the old normal was not normal. Mm. Okay. The new normal is a, is a far more sustainable uh, normal. Mm. I see. Um, wait, wait, wait. Please. If you allow me, Peter. Sorry. Please. Sorry, you. you yes. Were... Um, yes. No, no. Just uh, you know, just to compliment a little bit. First of all, I would like very much to underline what we just uh, uh, we just uh, uh, heard uh, about involvement of the communities. This is key, and this is very interesting. Just to tell you something, we this strategic plan we have now in Portugal for the recovery. Um, you know, it was uh, it was uh, under public consultation, and uh, you know there were thousands of um, of, uh, of of people um, wanting to participate. This is very interesting. It's very good, and it really uh, shows that people want to participate and to have a say uh, in their future uh, and the way they see the recovery. This, for me, is a key aspect. Uh, of um, of the recovery, um, and uh, another important thing is that we need to work in multiple dimensions. It means we need to work, of course, in the big uh, in the big PPPs infrastructures. But this model is for uh, big projects. And in my uh, previous life, in one of my previous lives, I do remember that uh, we worked on. Uh, energy projects and it was very interesting because they were PPP ones uh, and they they were financed their projects in uh, southern mediterranean one of the the mediterranean southern mediterranean countries uh, it was financed by the uh, european investment bank and other banks and uh, uh, you know the model was basically uh, the government um established uh, a business plan that was, uh, of course, uh, uh, interesting for the private sector, um, and uh, uh, and it was uh, and it and it worked and it was a success. So the government said, "Okay, I I, I gave you this uh, uh, this uh, this business for twenty years. Uh, you have uh, you have some obligations, and it worked very well." So, but this is for big projects. But at the same time, we need, uh, as someone of you just mentioned, we need also uh, to um, to be to be aware that we need to preserve and we need to animate small and medium enterprises. This this medium, this small and medium, and even micro enterprises are key. Uh, for the animation of the economy, they are key in in, in Europe, but they are all, 90 percent of the uh, economic fabric in, in Europe is uh, is is composed by uh, small and medium enterprises. But we need desperately them uh, in uh, in Africa, for example, uh, or in other developing countries. This is what really can trigger entrepreneurship, uh, it can trigger, it can create jobs, and it can really also create um, an, an inclusive growth. So just, I think we need to work in different I'm dimensions. Just, I'm, just wondering if, I'm just wondering if the institutional framework we have now for this sort of thing is adequate, is, is up to the job. So, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. so well, well, some some institution has to governments can set broad priorities in, and, and and then those prior, priorities have to be narrowed down and specified. You know, there's a, there's a mountain of things which 
which which are involved in, 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 in infrastructure investment. The question is, who does it? Who who is best suited to doing these tasks? And that is where I think you, is a very interesting topic. You mentioned the European Investment Bank. Very few British people have ever heard of the European Investment Bank. But um, we are probably going to lose that funding because we're leaving the European Union. And the question has arisen in, in, in the UK whether we should have um, an infrastructure bank. And we had something called, uh, I think it was called the Green Investment Bank, which was very successful. And so it's successful. It was sold off to Macquarie, the, the Australian bank, and they made that um, British uh, thing into a global infrastructure business. Is it is a is a dedicated is a dedicated state backed infrastructure bank necessary where 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 it concentrates the 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 expertise for infrastructure in that institution and then works with the private sector or do you just say no we believe in the free market we believe in free enterprise we're not going to have anything more to do you know let the banks do it their way i think the, the this is the sort of a, a question which which has which has to be addressed that's my personal opinion mr luby would you like to is it so, yes, again, I, guess, uh, I mean, it's it's a very interesting uh, question, and you know, there is probably not the direct answer, but uh, it it still brings me back to my old argument that if we take just you know necessary big infrastructure projects, it's down to the price of capital, and every country has a different price stack that you know what kind of uh, interest rates you 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 get the capital uh, access to the capital, but that's why you know the more important thing is that what kind of projects do you finance? That, that choice is the toughest, that you make the right choices because usually they are very costly if you go wrong. Mm. And therefore, you know, I, I come to this that, you know, maybe PPP shouldn't be like this traditional way saying it's about private sector financing it first and then governments buying it back. But meaning private and public sector invest together. But who decides on the who decides on the project? You said deciding on the project. But if, 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 the, if, the private, if the private sector has uh, its own skin in the in the game as well, hmm. so I suppose they help the governments to make right choices that they see the value also in the long term. Otherwise, government decide we will need to this road or this uh, energy park, and hmm. private sector just competes who gets its cheapest, hmm. and but they don't give any any reasoning. Is it actually necessary in the long term or not? So if we get them, you know, more involved as well, and they take the risk, and they that's why that's why I was arguing in the beginning as well that anything regarding innovation, the big project looking into the future, I think PPP has a great potential. Yes, but I'm still I'm sorry I'm still thinking if are we talking about bureaucrats in a government ministry having meetings with with bankers? And people from construction firms, or are we talking about a separate institution backed by the state, which is a dedicated infrastructure lender? To my mind, that makes more sense than having somebody from the Ministry of Transport or the Ministry of Energy having a meeting with such and such a bank. Because that's just my personal opinion. Peter, just to let you know, I'm looking at my thing and it's telling me we've got 19 seconds left. <laughs> I think we have. <laughs> I think, I think. well, listen, I, I think in that case, um, I will stop talking and I will just thank all of you very, very much. And um, uh, and it's all, all the preparations, all the troubles we had beforehand have been worth it. And we've had a most stimulating discussion. I hope other people have been watching. Uh, or will watch um, on YouTube or whatever it is. Um, and thank you all again for sharing. It's been a pleasure. Time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure thank listening you. to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope thank to you. see you all next uh, next year here in in Portugal in studio. Oh, that would, would be, be lovely. Much more pleasant that, that than would, that, be... that, would, that would be much nicer. It would be lovely. Well, I, had, yes. I, I, had, I had my I did have my hotel and my flights booked.
But uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I, but I, now I've got I, credit notes. <laughs> yeah, I have some yes. TNT vouchers. So, yeah. so I'm sure that we'll meet. We'll meet Thank here you. next year. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.